I got eight simple DM tips on how to efficiently run a spellcaster, monster, boss, or bad guy. They can be intimidating and overwhelming to run and honestly cause a lot of stress, especially for new dungeon masters. So I purposely ran a very low magic campaign when I first started dungeon mastering because I was afraid of running casters and spell casters and keeping track of all the stuff just freaked me out. But over time, as I developed a lot of these tips and became more and more efficient, my world became more and more magical. And so did the enemies now, because with these tips, I could run multiple casters off without missing a beat or slowing down combat myself as I scramble through all the things of what I think about what I'm gonna do. This video is voted on by my patrons who vote on videos I make each and every month to see what you guys wanna see as a thank you for the support you have for this channel to make all of this thing possible. With everything that I've kept growing this channel to be, making two videos a month, starting a Kickstarter, monthly D&D resources called DC Playbooks that I give my patrons because I appreciate it and I would not be able to do any of what I just listed off without you. So thank you. And right now I'm doing a big discount for any patron who wants to support me annually because right now the fluctuation of patrons coming and going, it really does kind of shake things up for me. So the annual option, I really do appreciate. So I want to give you a discount for that next level support. All right, now let's get into it. Number one, less tracking. Only have at will casting, which is when they can cast it as many times as they want. No spell slots required. Recharge abilities, which is where you roll the D6, and if it lands on a five or six, it recharges. And once per long rest casting. This is a huge tip for dungeon masters, is not to count spell slots for your monsters. Just stop it. They simply have a list of spells they can cast, and that's it. Why would you need to track their spell slots? What does it add to the experience of the players to make it more memorable or something? It just adds another hurdle for you to have to keep track of or how many times can I cast? Uh. If you want to restrict the frequency of how often they cast spells, you got one of two options. The recharge method, which is that five or six rolling of the dice. You can also change it towards four through six or make the percentages change or whatever, but that adds a little bit of randomness. And there's the rules as written has that in plenty of different abilities like Dragon's Breath stuff. And this adds some sort of variability and maybe maybe even scariness to if the ability comes back or not. And you can really make that thing a lot more powerful if it has some of the ability to maybe not recharge. But even then, as a side note for Dragon's Breath, I also have the Dragon's Breath weapon reset if it reaches half health, just because that's more scary. But if you don't like the randomness and you want to restrict how often they could do this, this could be a fireball for a low level spellcaster. Maybe they only get it one time and then do they do the fireball thing and it's crazy. Or at higher levels, maybe a fireball is one of the at will spells and they could do it every round. Why not? You're as the dungeon master are in control if you even choose to do that or not. But have certain abilities that they can only do once in some sort of big moment, kind of like I've talked about in previous monster videos where you prepare and plan out the things you're gonna do. So they can use this big ability and if they get away and they escape in some kind, it'll recharge. This also gives the players a sense of urgency if they use one of these types of abilities and they know that they have to recharge it in some way. If they chase them down and stop them from long resting, they maybe have a chance again. Which now leads me to what abilities they can do. Number two is to pick a handful of spells. Not a full crazy list of spells of things that will never come up and are highly situational. D that just doesn't make sense. Think of what spells would make sense for them and you could see yourself actually using and maybe even plan some of those out and the ones that you don't ever see yourself going for as an option, take those off. And if there's more complicated spells that you don't want to get into all the complicatedness, just take parts of the spell and basically homebrew, peel them back to be a lot more simple to just be a certain save for this amount of damage and it causes this effect. Because those are the types of things you need to write down, not the spell name that you haven't memorized because you don't know that spell. If you do know that spell and haven't memorized, props to you, but write down the stuff that you could look at and do. So write down what the save is, write down the DC, write down the things that are important for you to be able to do that spell. Number three is pre-planned moves. Like I've talked about in my base monster video, it is a lot easier to run off a spell caster if you plan out what the spell caster is going to do. Most of the problem when running off spell casters is the paralysis by analysis that you get with so many options. So so in your game prep for this caster that probably does have more options than usual, think through those, plan it out. What things would you maybe want them to do? Have some sort of opening ability that you for sure are going to use and that takes it off the table. As soon as you've decided the opening move, now that first round of combat, you don't have to spend almost any brain power or time thinking about what they're going to do because you already planned it beforehand. They're going to do this thing. They're going to open up with a uh, cloud kill spell. Then also highlight, and literally you could actually use 
highlighters here or whatever you do digitally is have some sort of combo move that they pull off or some sort of maybe with their layer action combined with an ability they do some sort of cool thing or a big finisher at the end like I've talked about before you also have a lot of freedom here with some of the more complex monsters to do crazy things with legendary actions and have cool homebrewed legendary actions that can combine with what other players do or what other environmental things are going on. Number four here is my personal favorite is a monster cheat sheet. I did a player focused video on how players can do this for the things that they are capable of, but this is very similar here. A player and the capabilities that a player has sometimes will be less than what you have this big, huge villain to be able to do, depending on how complicated you want to make things, because uh, that would be a lot. Only have the things that you need in front of you, which is why in general, I do not ever look at monster stat blocks whenever I'm running him in the game. Even if I, I've already talked about this too, I don't really run straight up normal monster stat blocks. I always homebrew them, add some cool stuff to it. But whatever monster I'm running, I have a sheet written down with only the most important stuff on it now, which is why in a lot of the different homebrew PDF resources I have, I have monsters on there and you'll see they are organized by this way. I have passives and auras written first. Oh, this should be shown right here. Passives and auras written first. What they can do is their action, their bonus action, their reaction. So I can compartmentalize and think out what they actually can do. Any sorts of strengths or weaknesses they have so I can remember them are right here. Legendary actions are over there and it's all organized based on the types of stuff that they will do. And before I created any of this type of stuff, I would do this on literal index cards and have only the minimum stuff that I needed to be able to run in the combat. So for myself personally, if I was listing off at will spells that the caster could just freely use, I would have a section of that under actions and I'd list off what actions they could cast at will of spells. And then I'd have a bonus action section of what things they could do as a bonus action with their spells. Which leads me right to number five. I'm really doing a good job segueing these things is monsters. And this is a whole rant video I could do on this, which in fact, I, I am going to do a thing on this. So I'll save this full rant for it. But monsters can cast multiple spells in the same round. Yes, I know players can only cast one spell per round. If you cast a spell as an action, you can't cast a spell as a bonus action. That does not apply to monsters, or it doesn't have to apply to monsters. But basically, monsters do not have to follow the exact rules as players. They operate on a completely different level. Players don't have legendary actions. They don't have legendary resistances. They can't do layer actions. And ask yourself, why do monsters have these things? It's to give them an edge to make them challenging to your players, because they are more of them than they are of you. Give these monsters these types of power so the players have to overcome it. So if you want to cast Misty Step as a bonus action, then use a spell. I'm giving you permission to do it. I'm already telling you to remove spell slots, so this isn't that much of a leap. Biggest reason why this helps efficiency though is you're not so restricted by like, oh, I actually, I casted, I can't do this now. Uh, uh, sure, follow the rules that they have an action. They have a bonus action, they have a reaction. Follow those rules, don't give them just two actions, they can cast multiple spells. That will feel unfair. Stick to the base rules and add little tweaks to power. And now we're going into overtime with some rapid fire tips. Number six is what I've kind of already talked about in the player video and a little bit earlier. I got excited and <laughs> said it there, but have a shorthand list of the different things that you need. Saving throws, range of the spell, radiuses of all this type of stuff, how much damage is dealt, what the type of damage is, things that you know you'll forget write those down in shorthand that you can remember and it speaks your own language. Number seven is just go. This might be a little bit weird of a tip here, but don't take forever to perfectly optimize exactly what you want to do as the dungeon master. Yes, there are times that are very important and it makes sense for you to have to kind of stop and really think about what you're going to do, but you don't always every single turn have to have the perfect turn. It's all about the experience and the pace and flow of combat and it'll be a better experience if you keep it going sometimes. You got to know the feel of your table and keep it rolling because you as the dungeon master don't have the luxury that the PC wizard has to sit there and wait for everybody else to go. A lot of times you're having to do stuff, even on other players' turns, you're having to issue out things, move stuff around, make rolls on your end. You have a lot of stuff going on and you don't have that luxury. Tip number eight is to start small. Whenever you are first starting this whole trying to be more efficient with spellcasters or running a big time spellcaster for the first time, just have one of them whenever you're doing this thing, one complicated monster and a bunch of very simple monsters that are basically, they. It, granted, it, I, I don't like having very basic monsters. I always like to have little homebrew tweaks and stuff, but when you're first starting out, it's okay to have very basic monsters and really focus on 
being better at running the more complicated ones. You can only handle so much complexity as a dungeon master of whatever skill level you're at, so really focus on that one creature and all the complexities there. Then you can open up and have multiple of them and do whatever else you want to do. And I guess this would be tip number nine, but we're going to make this a bonus tip here, is stick to a certain flavor of spells and not just random crap. Give your monsters a theme of something that they have going on instead of just like, oh, I want them to do this and this and this and that. It's going to be a lot more dynamic of a feel going on if they have some sort of necrotic eroding theme of decay and disease. It would feel really weird for the decay and disease creature to cast the fireball. Now you could have a reflavored fireball spell that's a necrotic glob of acid flying through the ground and it sits there and it creates an acid pool on the ground and add extra stuff there along with that theme. Instead of a dexterity saving throw for 8d6, maybe it's a constitution saving throw for 8d6 and they get a disease. A vampiric life draining ability type theme should be able to have some sort of healing abilities and now they have to think creatively on how they can stop that healing effect. Maybe the boss deals with some sort of environmental stuff and that's kind of their shtick is they do all this stuff messing with the environment. Maybe they summon ads and that's their crazy thing is they keep ads. Do I attack the ads or do I attack them? Maybe they get stronger over time and as they get less and less health, they deal more and more damage. Maybe there's spells that cause illusions on the battlefield. Some are real, some are not. Maybe they mind control different party members. But pick one of these categories of this cool stuff and run with it. Maybe two if you can really think of a cool way to blend them together. It just feels a lot better to me and more unique of a certain theme of a monster to have a certain feel and flavor to it instead of just like, oh, they can do all these random things. It has ads and messes with this and, and, and. So whatever theme you do choose to run with, tweak those descriptions like I said about the fireball to make it fit the look and mechanics of whatever that flavor is. So if y'all want help creating and homebrewing all these different type of monster abilities, let me know because I have a PDF over on my website with over 150 different monster features to be able to throw in, take and run with. Each one of those features could be a theme that you could build on top of. Also with all of those features comes a build a baddie table where you can build and homebrew monsters in seconds on the fly based on different categories. Or you can use it like I do and kind of look over the thing and try and fill in the gaps with certain monsters. There's different types of rows for different types of monsters and different types of columns for offense, defense, or utility. So I hope these tips help you run off casters more efficiently and it be less intimidating. Click right here for more videos I got on monster stuff and more and click right here to help support what I do here over on Patreon. So until next time, stay creative and think outside that box. Peace.